right, we're going to look at heroic narrative and the epic today. Um, in uh, Riken's book, he takes two chapters on it, although they're relatively brief. And um, here he picks up in the idea of a, a heroic narrative or heroic story and in the epic more of a theme than uh, a genre. Although there is a genre called epic, it's uh, more dealing with the, the whole plot trajectory here. And it seems to me a really almost a dominant uh, literary uh, theme in scripture. It's why the people find the Bible so extraordinary. Remember we, we said at the outset that the dominant um, form of writing found in scripture is narrative, not poetry, although it, there's a course on the Bible as literature. There's, there's a significant portion of literature and, and we'll spend a significant part of the course looking at the poetry, but still the majority of it is written as narrative and of narrative, it seems to me that uh, hero stories and, uh, and epic are at the heart of it. So when it comes to epic, just to give you a sense of what I regard as epic, the story of Moses and the story of David are hero stories, so is the book of Revelation, and so is the Bible as a whole. So there's a sense in which um, I'll substantiate that a little bit later on because I want to start by looking at the hero story before moving on to the epic. The epic is a broader, grander form of hero story, of broader significance. It includes uh, national history and destiny and so forth in, a, in an epic, but not necessarily in a hero story. But we get heroes throughout scripture. They're admirable figures. Uh, what true heroes do is they express the already accepted social norms and moral norms, more importantly, but, and they also capture the popular imagination through their deeds. They act for good. Everyone loves a hero story. And in these hero stories, like all hero stories, actually, we have something of the pedagogy being illustrated, which is that of imitation. These are people that we admire, but also whom we should follow as examples. They're being held up as models of conduct. And that is a departure from the sort of heroism which appears after the Romantics. As a, I've already talked about several times in class, the idea of the orphan uh, who somehow has a power within himself or herself that we have no way of seeing or imitating because it's unique to that person. They express it. And it's particularly expressed in modern comic book superheroes who have powers, but their moral virtue is not being commended to us. We can't imitate Spider-Man. We can't imitate the Batman. Any of these characters. We can't be like Harry Potter. Harry Potter is the rage. All, you know, everyone talks about how wonderful Harry Potter is. It gets the kids reading. They're very interested, etc. Say so yes, and uh, reading is. Uh, rather than not reading, I can understand why you would think that was a good thing. On the other hand, is there any moral virtue that Harry Potter expresses that we ought to be imitating per se? Is that the whole point of the story? And it isn't. It's actually not really about the moral conduct of Harry Potter. But everyone looks in astonishment at him, wonders at him, even the wise old teachers of which Dumbledore is the most significant. The wisest, the old man with the, be the beard is wondering at this little boy. 
who has powers because he's got a little scar on his forehead, etc. He's something there, something magical, but it's something really that's impossible to model one's life on. So a very different sort of hero, but those are the sorts that we get in fiction these days. We could la- name any number of them. Likewise, the James Bond. I mean, you want the list goes on. They're all orphans. They all cannot be imitated, but you are encouraged to be like them. There's no moral standard. There's no social standard. There is no moral norms being upheld. There is a fight against injustice, but justice is not defined. And we find very quickly that many of the heroes veer into doing unjust things to uphold justice, hence Batman, etc. And find some of the heroes are not particularly likable even. There's a shift... And and so there's a blurring of moral boundaries characteristic of modern heroic presentations. This is not the case in scripture. At the same time, the heroes are presented in ways that are entirely plausible because they are often presented with typical strengths and weaknesses. So let me talk about different categories of heroes. There are four different types, basically. There are those who are idealized, firstly, They're paragons of virtue, like Daniel. Doesn't really seem realistic. So, so, Joseph likewise. There are those who are tragic, very good people, but with a tragic character flaw. Let's take Samson. He's one of the judges, he's a significant judge, brings down his enemies around him. He has a character flaw. It's pretty obvious what it is. Uh, There are comic heroes. These are very flawed characters who triumph in spite of their flaws. But the dominant one is, is the realistic hero who combines strengths and weaknesses like we have. That's interesting. We we talked about scripture as, yes, a literary genre marked by this dual quality. It combines the realistic with the miraculous. It also purports, because of what we saw back in Genesis, to be interested, even though it's from God's perspective, God reveals it, It's very much interested in human history, not what we'd expect from a theological book, from a spiritual book. Very opposed to Eastern spirituality, which really is not concerned with what happens in the world. That's just a sort of um, mirage, as it were. The spiritual is an inward turning that ignores what's happening in the world. So there are these four categories of heroes and their pattern of life uh, is significant and it also ends well. Heroes usually end well. When I say that they are exemplary, that doesn't mean that they are not, that they are simple or moralizing. They're not art, they're not allegories. Right? We get no sense that the characters we read about are written as allegories. We could, we'll maybe talk about the book of Job as a special case later on and try and engage with that book, which is really quite difficult in some ways. But these, uh, the choice of what, which of these four heroes you're going to portray, uh, or the types, are going to reflect our uh, comment upon three great matters in life, three of them. One. What are your principles? What matters the most? Where is your red line you will not cross? What is the principle for the hero? They do have principles, by the way. There are first things for them. Everything's not socially negotiable. Yes, they reflect their society. Yes, they reflect certain moral norms, but those don't change. Where are their principles? Where do they see a line and and draw it and won't cross it. So it's related to these great matters of firstly their principles. Note I say principles and not values. 
Secondly, uh, their morality. That is what constitutes good and evil behavior. Think about Daniel not eating the food offered to him in Babylon for what reason is not entirely clear, but refusing to do it out of a matter of conscience. And secondly, what is ultimate reality? This is, it's obviously related to their principles. It's obviously related to their morality since morality doesn't change. But what do they think the nature of life and the universe is? And of course, because of what we've seen back in Genesis, it's related to the fact that God is transcendent, that he is omniscient, omnipotent, that he is good, he is the creator, and also we're going to find he is also the savior. So in Genesis 1, we find out that God is creator in the story of Moses, already anticipated by Genesis 3.16. We find that our, the, our God who created all things will also redeem all things. He will be the one that crushes the head of the serpent. Even Eve understands that when she has a child, Cain, and says, I have had a man, the Lord. She thinks, ah, She's understood God's talking about the seed of the woman. And it can't be a man. She's understood, actually, something over there. She has faith at that point. Both Adam and Eve repent and believe in God's plan. If they hadn't, they might have decided to take their own lives. Who knows? In Milton's Paradise Lost, that's one of the scenarios discussed between the two. So uh, hero stories are, are about struggles and triumphs common to the human race. So we can identify with them. That's what makes them powerful. We can identify with them. Harry Potter, we can't identify with. Superheroes, we can't ad identify with because we can't be like them. They are not heroes. We call them heroes. We lack vocabulary to describe what they are. They're propaganda mechanisms is what they are. Hero stories are about the struggles and the triumphs of the whole human race, and there is an implied comment about life within the story. Even though it's not written as political commentary or social commentary, there's an, there's an application to what is being told there, which, when you think through the implications, become evident. This is why the whole Bible gets banned throughout the world in countries. They know the implications of this sort of story. It's not just that Jesus is Lord and they're not. There's more than that. That's, that's implied everywhere, that God is Lord and they're not. That's throughout scripture. We'll, we'll see that in particular when we come to the epic at, at the end of this. But there's an implied comment about life and reality, and it lends insight in how to live and also how to flourish. Everyone lives. What does it mean to really live and to do well? So it, in this sense, it carries uh, common features with, with wisdom literature. Wisdom literature is a special category. We'll look at that. But these heroes have a certain sort of wisdom about them. They're not Gandalfs. They're not, you know, wizards, they don't have that sort of status, but there's something wise about their lives that is being held up as a model for us as well. So all those things are at stake in these hero stories. And I think everyone implicitly understands that when they read the stories as well. There's a point of view which, which the reader can't miss dare to be a Daniel, right? So as I say, most Bible stories are hero stories. Any comments or questions here so far? Um, 
I mean, sometimes they, there's an overlap here, right? So there's a between principles, morality, and reality. Well, because of your view of ultimate reality, you have certain principles about it, which will be reflected in your morality. I just want to disambiguate them a little bit, but there's overlap, clearly. I mean, your, your morals are going to be very strongly connected with your principles, but you would not regard, for instance, the worship of Yahweh and not Baal as a matter of morality, normally. I mean, it is because of the nature of the God and what the implications are, but per se, worshiping this God doesn't seem any more moral than worshiping this God. The nature of the God will reflect that. But so are you a monotheist or are you a polytheist? That's going to be part of your principles. Just right. But it has moral implications. Sure, this God demands this. This God demands this. And what they demand is very distinct. The the gods of the Canaanites uh, involve, among other things, uh, serial promiscuity, sexual initiation rites, child sacrifice, you go on. Whereas the God of Israel wants to be worshipped alone, but also promotes monogamy in marriage. And so very different. So their morality, that, but that flows out of the nature of God. But again, uh, on, on the surface, the principle would be different than the moral considerations. And but that and when, so when I talk about reality, of course God is the ultimate reality, but again that's going to be played out in everything because of the way God relates to everything. It's going to affect how uh, heroes uh, relate to peoples around them, not just their own peoples but the other nations. Because God is the God of the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, so we'll see that sort of tension there. Other comments or questions? I really want to get to the epic, so I move that along rather quickly. But as I say, these features are going to be there in the epics because epics are hero stories, just on a grander scale. Um, so we could look at, and I mentioned this already, the idealized version of heroes. Daniel is one of them, for sure. And so he's so heroic, he almost breaks or probably does break the basic rule of narrative, which is a unity of action. There are these episodes here that seem disconnected. And they all emphasize how extraordinary Daniel is, pushes him into Harry Potter territory. Right? He does miraculous things. Can you be like Daniel? Dare to be a Daniel. Okay. How do I do that? Well, there's not a lot given in the text. He has his principles, he has his morality, he has a certain view of reality, for sure. Uh, in what other ways? Well, they learn all of the Babylonian uh, languages. They can operate in that way. They understand the ways of those that they don't agree with. At the same time, they're distinct and are very much faithful to their God and won't bow down to the golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar. That's not a matter of morality, that's a matter of principles in accordance with their view of ultimate reality. Okay. So it's very, that's very much in the idealized form of a hero. We don't get many of those in scripture. Again, Joseph likewise. Prominent are miracles in those sorts of figures. Now, th because they're all heroes, there's something of each type of hero that overlaps a little bit. Heroes, all heroes can do miraculous things and sometimes do. Some of them are, the emphasis is very strongly on that. And as I say, the majority are presented realistically. Uh, let's look at some other ones. Uh, let's look at uh, two books named after women. Ruth, which uh, Riken calls the supreme masterpiece of narrative in the Bible. It's a pastoral setting. If you wanted a uh, technical term, it would be an idyllic romance. I don't have to write that on the board.
not taking place amongst the king and queen, kings and queens, seemingly irrelevant to the plot line of scripture, seemingly. Not talking about a male figure even. Talking about a woman who's born outside the covenant and yet is brought into the covenant and becomes instrumental in her offspring being a part of God's plans. So very extraordinary in that sense. And as a uh, as a narrative itself, as Riken says, it is uh, supreme. So what do we note about this? Um, it's the, the plot is terrific. The characterization is extraordinary, by the way. The characters are very, very, very rich. Lots of allusions, great dialogue. Um, it's a short story. It's only four books. Describes rural life. You can imagine her as a sort of an immigrant or a refugee, sort of a bit like that. So it's interesting. All the issues that are of interest to the to the left in politics now, they're there in the Book of Ruth. Uh, just like we saw in Abraham. Abraham, although he's a king, goes and becomes a sort of a, a wanderer. And God works in that, not just in the courts of the powerful. Um, and yet there are matters of, 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 of court, uh, unlike Esther, we're going to come to Esther, where it's about court etiquette. It's almost the opposite. Esther's like Cinderella. There, it's very much in the court. There's a matter of decorum. There's a matter of um, social manners on a high scale, the right way to do things. Ruth is very basic in the sense that we're dealing with the absolute necessities of life. For her to survive, she has to glean from the uh, the outskirts of a person's field where they drop stuff. That's how she survives. Social scale at the, to- at the opposite end. It deals with death and birth. It deals with family dynamics. deals with motherhood. deals with... Uh, religious devotion, your God will be my God, etc. And it deals with romance, Boaz. Uh, most heroic stories are what Riken calls a U-shaped, they have a U-shaped plot. It starts well, drops down, goes up, and then returns in the end, it ends up very happy. It's your sort of typical hero stories. But it does begin in tragedy, and it has to overcome obstacles along the way. And there's even a journey motif in it. She begins uh, and, ha- and has a quest. She, she, she journeys from Moab, which is a historic enemy of Israel, to Bethlehem, interesting place. I might have heard of that. And then ends up uh, and goes from the house of Naomi to the farm of Boaz. It's a very skillful plot, and it ends up in a climactic nighttime meeting between Boaz and Ruth on a threshing floor. You think, what's with the threshing floor? Very important. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but um, the, the lead characters are introduced very early on, with the exception of Boaz, who enters in a little bit later although she is mentioned by Naomi as a relative. Let's go there, because he'll look after me. He's my kinsman redeemer, becomes an important theological motif. And it will become part of this story, even. Uh, There's also a foil in the plot, so it's a complex plot, or a subplot, if you will, Um, We have the youthful daughters-in-law who are able to bear children versus the barren Naomi. We have a a faithless uh, woman by the name of Orpah, the sister of Ruth, faithful. 
They love each other. One's faithless, the other's faithful. They're foils in how they respond to Naomi. And we also get a contrast between Naomi, who's bitter and cannot see any possibility of redemption. She's a defeatist versus the courage of Ruth and the hopefulness with which she traverses her journey in life. She remains optimistic with no more evidence or reason for being optimistic than Naomi had. Uh, the romance between Ruth and Boaz is pretty early there in chapter 2. Ref references to a harvest. Bearing children down the road. Right? There's a sowing of seed time and then there's a harvest time. Harvest time is when what has been planted comes to life. All these are symbols of a sexual uh, tension or at least attraction between the two and and has the romance quality. But it's idyllic because it's set in, in a pastoral setting, but the pastoral setting is not just your usual countryside setting. It's idealized. Boaz is presented as a very great man, admirable. He sees Ruth as an extraordinarily beautiful woman. He's a very good farmer, Boaz. He is a very religious man. He's a very compassionate man. And he's also significantly older than Ruth, however. Uh, we've already talked about Ruth. She also is marked by modesty and gentleness. We see this in relation to her mother-in-law, Naomi. We see this in the way she relates to the young men who are interested in her. And she's not interested in them. How come? She is desperate. She has no f way of supporting herself. These young men would have provided for her. She doesn't go after them. Boaz is flattered by the fact that she doesn't go after the young men and is more interested in him. How come? What it is it about Boaz that attracts Ruth? You have to look to the text to see. It's not because of his youthful good looks, obviously. There's lots of, there is a bit of comedy in there. Boaz is aware of the differences in age and how comic it is in a sense. Like this is an impossible relationship. He's more aware of it than she is. She doesn't seem to be moved by that. Um, and we're, and, and part of the comedy is that we, the reader, seem to recognize very on, early on they're going to end up together. Right? It's very early. We know, but they don't seem to know. And so this, this sort of discrepancy between the audience's awareness of the si situation and the characters gives us great delight as well. Because we're going to say, well, how do they come to the point where they realize what we already realize? How are they going to get there? And so there's, there's irony. Uh, uh, there. This is dramatic irony, where the audience knows and the characters don't know. There's a great deal of delight in that. It's never there in Harry Potter. There's no irony, because everyone says that he's going to, right? Everyone knows, including him, because everyone says it all the time. It's like, so there's no tension here at all. It's like, oh my goodness, such it's a terrible plot design. I don't want to beat up on Harry Potter today. It just I'm seeing the billboards in Toronto and on the subway and all this. And it's a marvel to say that says the Toronto Star or whatever. I mean, whatever. All promotion. Very rich. Um, and he, he uh, Reichen comments, I cringe every time I read a theologian's comment that, quote, when the narrative trimming is stripped away, the story of Ruth takes its place as simply one more bit of Heilsgeschichte holy history, for it serves to trace the background of the great David. All this is true, but it this story, nobody reads it for that reason. And uh, it jumps and is many people's favorite passage in scripture because there's a lot more here than that. 
this is not just a footnote to the story of Jesus and David. It, it isn't. It simply isn't. And it, this is Reichen concluding. He says, against, against such reductionism, I offer the statement of a literary critic who holds up, quote, a picture of the author of Ruth as an artist in full command of a complex and subtle art, which, which art is exhibited in almost every word of the story. And he said his, his comment concluding is that heroic narrative exists to do justice to the humanity of our experience in the world. And this is true also of the religious hero stories that we find in the Bible. Okay, so this is the purpose of it because again, if you have 66 books in scripture, everyone says, this is the canon of scripture. All of it is God's word. It's God's revelation. It's there. It's indubitably, indubitably there. Why do we bother with Ruth, the story of Ruth? Maybe we need stories about women. And I don't say that as a from the perspective of identity politics. The Bible is giving us realism. How can, you not, how can you have realism in scripture that ignores the heroism particular to women in certain situations? As I say, Ruth from the humble side, Esther from the exalted side. Once again, heroic narrative exists to do justice to the humanity of our experience in the world. And that's why we can imitate it. That's why we admire it. That's why we want to be a Ruth if we're in that situation. Or an Esther if we were placed in that extraordinary position. Perhaps God intended it for such a time as this, that you would be in this position where the entirety of your nation is dependent upon you. Uh, why don't I talk briefly about Ex Esther, who, which I also love. As I say, the heroine is more of a Cinderella. It has two stories, and they are simultaneous. On the one, it's a hero story that focuses on Ruth, or who, Ruth Esther. And if you look at it from the light of that, then it is follows the Cinderella motif, falls easily into a well-made the design of a well-made plot. How does that work? Well, Queen Vashti is dethroned. Esther is enthroned. Mordecai saves the king's life. Very simple. And there is a, a force that drives that on which seems contrary to it, which is the hatred of Mordecai. Haman, not Mordecai. The hatred of Haman towards Mordecai, which seems unreasonable. And the reason it seems unreasonable isn't because of Mordecai. It's because of what Haman decides to do to get back at Mordecai, which is to kill them all. They all have to die. Takes it from an, an ordinary heroic framework and magnifies it on a epic scale, on a genocidal scale, it seems particularly apt given the Holocaust. Right? There's an, there is a, an extraordinary level of animosity, not directed at just at an individual, but a, at a whole group of people. And therefore, we know who this group of people is. These are God's chosen people. So it's directed at God. God's not mentioned in the book of Esther. But everyone knows these are. this is the people of Israel, and Haman is after them. And so, in a sense, where else do we see the extinction of, the, of, the, uh, Isra of Israel in a plot? We see it in the Exodus. She's a sort of a Moses figure then. Not the same, but has that same sort of epic scope. Um, so there, the, what incites the plot is Haman's rage that Mordecai won't bow down before him. 
So it has to do with his principles, not with his morality, because this will entail worship. I'm not going to worship anyone or anything other than God. Um, the, there's a plot in which Haman decides he's going to avenge his hurt pride at the lack of social respect, which is more than about social respect. And he seems to understand that. Like this is not a, a, a this is a psychopathic response. Okay, so he didn't bow down. What do you care? Why? No, I am so outraged. I'm going to kill him and everyone uh, of his people. So there's uh, and tension arises from that. And then there's a turning point when Esther decides to confront the king. Climax comes when she discloses her problem to the king, right? And resolves itself in it, as I say, another U-shaped plot. Resolves itself, it looks like it's going to be tragic, and then ends up being the exact opposite. It is epic in the sense that it is about nas national deliverance, and it is to this day celebrated by uh, Jews. Festival of Purim, right? Uh, comments or questions about that? I, I realize I went over it very quickly, but at least I mentioned it. I skipped over a lot of others, like Gideon. We could have spent more time on Daniel as well, but I want to get to the epic. Yes? Interesting. Well, that would be a good argument, wouldn't it be, if, if uh, Ruth is placed after the book of Proverbs. It, the book of Proverbs concludes with the virtuous woman, and then we get the test case for the virtuous woman. Except she's not a wife, <laughs> right? It, it's almost the contradiction of it. Here we have a single woman deprived of a husband. You could see them as two states. Here's an adult woman without a husband, and here is an adult woman with a husband. But again, when it comes to the editorial choices of where things put are put in scripture, we can only guess. There's no explanation given for that choice, per se, anywhere. And you can find a logic to it, but it is speculating. Um, so I noticed that in the Minor Prophets, it always begins with Hosea. And Hosea reveals to us the theme of the bridegroom and the bride, the bride being a harlot. And that's talking about, and that becomes a dominant theme throughout all 12 of the Minor Prophets. Very important. It starts with that one. I think uh, that was observed to me this summer by Dr. Michael Haken. I thought, that, oh, that's an interesting idea. And in relation to a particular situation, uh, which is related to the coming exile, right? And why? And then, of course, that theme, which is just picked up there in the Minor Prophets, uh, as a significant theme, gets amplified in the book of Revelation. Other questions here? Let me move to the epic then. If you do have any questions, just raise your hand or interrupt me. Uh, epic is like the uh, our hero stories. They are hero stories. You've been introduced to the epic by me because I make a big deal of it in first year English. There are a lot of different genres in literature. Um, I don't try to go into all of them in first year English. I by and large ignore the lyric poem, which is what most of us think of as poetry. Little songs like we have in our pop songs, those are lyric poems, it's a type. I'm not talking about pop music per se, but that's a type, it's a, it's a, it's a very specific, related to a situation, it doesn't amplify much. It's just a song, but it is a, a genre. 
most people, when they think of poetry, think of that. And they don't like it. And they also think it's about self-expression. So we, in first year English, introduce people to the epic as a genre of literature because it, because it is significant unto itself, but also it is significant as Christians for the way in which we see stories connected to the story, the story of God. How does a national epic like Virgil's Aeneid relate to the biblical story, which uh, seems epic in its sweep because it, it tells a story of national history and, and destiny. Not just what happened in the past, but where this nation's going in the future. And there's a cumulative, this and this, and there's a build. It just seems each time a story is told, a little bit more clarity comes. A little bit sense, stronger is the sense of, of what we call eschatology. The last things are getting closer. The conflict gets stronger, not weaker. It gets more tumultuous. It's bad enough in Exodus. What's coming in the future is going to be even worse. But it's also going to be far better, far better than you ever imagined. So what are the characteristics of epics? Well, these are hero stories. They are immense in scope. So the whole Bible is epic in this sense. They are encyclopedic in their form. They teach us everything which we need to know about life and godliness. Not in the small things, but in the big things related to principles and ultimate reality and morality. These things are there in the epic as well. Um, they concern national identity. We live in a world which <clears throat> our prime minister says, from our country's perspective, which is an odd thing to say, but from our country's perspective, he's post-national. That's becoming a sentiment. Some call it globalism. How does that relate and how should Christians think about that in terms of the genre of epic and our sense that a nation is part of God's providential plan? Is post-nationalism inherently opposed to the epic sweep of scripture? Look at the Tower of Babel. Right? It's going to unite things and all the differences. And for the purposes of building a tower of human greatness all the way up to heaven. Uh, so thirdly, it has national identity. Fourthly, there is a historic impulse. So this is not just a myth or a legend. It's strong in undeniable groundedness in historical events. This is why the view of Exodus as fable or mythology is so simply wrong. It must be seen as a historical event. It's undeniable in it. It, it happened. If you deny that, you've misunderstood the nature of what you're re reading. But this is the problem when people approach the Bible as literature. They can't, they can't separate literary from realistic. And the Bible consistently fuses the two. And finally, there is a supernatural machinery. That is the, almost the most important distinctive about it, but that's the double quality of narrative I talked about already. already. Historically real, yet supernaturally miraculous. Examples of this. Uh, so Fry, um, Riken mentions Northrop Fry. He says the epic is the story of all things. That's what the Bible is then. 
encyclopedia is something that you give a, chil a child and it, we just happen, because it's a product of the Enlightenment, to categorize it in accordance with the letter of the alphabet. Encyclopedias do it alphabetically, A, B, C, your A to Z. What else does this? Wisdom literature. Some of the Psalms. From the Alpha to the Omega. Everything you need between these two. Right? Listed this way. So it, it and there's something representative about that listing. But it primarily doesn't work through listing. That's not how it, uh, children are taught in Israel. It's more the things that, like themes and uh, principles and morality and reality which are being taught and not and ordering the way we think about enumerating everything. So when you write your essays, people often number things because we're trying to say that numbering things is being um, comprehensive and scientific and considered. So we list all of the ways. But no relations between the numbers, by the way. Whereas in scripture, there are interconnections, overlaps that uh, go beyond mere numbering. Uh, so expansive, it summarizes what a whole age or a culture wishes to say. Now, part of this is the national hero. Um, and let me go with that to the first epic then, which is that of Moses. When I say Moses, we could talk about the whole five books of Moses, but probably because the one leads to the other, you can, you can hear, remember the books of Moses were given to Moses as revelation. He wrote them down, but they tell events before he was born. But what the events that happened before he was born led up to his moment of national deliverance. How did the people of Israel come to be the people of Israel? And how did they end up in Egypt? You've got to tell the back story to all that. And are you just going to begin with that? Are you going to begin with Abraham? Well, no, because this is not only the story of Israel. It happens to be the whole story of the whole human race. Well, then we have to tell the first 11 chapters as well. And that happens to be going to tell us not only about the peoples of the earth, but all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So it's going to be an extraordinary. You think Tolkien has a backstory behind his stories. But Moses is the first epic hero that we will really look at as such. And the Exodus has various uh, unifying frameworks. It has the, the uh, motif of a journey that's intrinsic to the word Exodus now in English. There's a journey. And sometimes journeys begin without moving. There's the story of Abraham, you could say, is epic, but we find very little about the beginning of Abraham's journey. He just decided to leave Haran, the land of his father. There's very little told about that. Uh, with Moses, my goodness, how much do we find out about Moses' childhood um, and his early struggles within Egypt? There's a lot there. Most of the Exodus narrative is there. So there's a journey motif. Um, so we rarely lose sight of the idea of traveling from the opening, anticipation of a trip, if Pharaoh would allow it, through the 40 years of wandering from one place to the next in the wilderness. And as we read the story, we also travel along with them. What's it like to travel while reading a story. That's what you're effectively doing. You're passengers along the way observing travelers. And most of what travelers do is mundane and not worth recording. And it's 40 years, so of course, not. but the uh, important events pop up along the way. One of the things that is going to be a part of a 40-year journey is, when are we going to get there, Dad? My kids ask that when we're in the car for an hour. Are we almost there yet? That's after the one minute. 
I know what's coming. When I get in the car, boredom. How long is this going to last? Uh, we also find, so there's a journey motif, there are archetypes at work. Now these archetypes uh, are part of what helps unify the story. It's going to be over 40 years, the whole of the story. What, what holds it together? Um, elemental things like water and fire, rocks and mountains mentioned. There's a rock that struck, there's the mountain where God reveals the Ten Commandments. There's the water that Moses is delivered out of early on. There's a lot of eating, the importance of eating. There's the food that they get back in Egypt, which has garlic. And they really like the flavor of garlic and they really miss it. And then they have this, this white stuff called manna. This is so bad that God, so bad and yet so nourishing that I think God's chuckling at them by calling it manna because manna means what is it? They're like, what is it? What is it? It's, it's what is it? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. You. What is it? What is it? It's, you know, there's, there's comedy in it. Um, we have we have uh, a wor a global superpower in Egypt at the time. We also have a desert where no one lives, and deserts go all the way back to Genesis one and two and three. They thrown out. It's where Eden is not. That's a funny place for the people of God to be sent. There are references to rods. There's references to arms, especially the arm of God. God only has one arm, by the way. The one armed, he's got a right arm. I'm not saying he doesn't have a left arm. There's no mention of the left arm. He has a right arm. Something of the culture in this, in Semitic cultures, you use your right arm for eating and shaking hands and doing all various things. You use your left arm for only one thing, which is to wipe your backside. God has no left arm. There's a curse. If you extend your left hand to somebody in the Middle East, it's a huge insult to this day. Right? Canada, I'm left-handed, so I give you my left hand. Right? You might be tempted. And you would associate nothing with it. So there's associations with this. God is right-handed. Right-handedness is associated with blessings. Interesting. Right? It, so his ways are good and just. That's being implied even in the association. God has no arms, by the way. He's a spirit. Right? It's an anthropomorphism. They understand that. That's why it's just mentioned. But he has one arm. But it's the right arm. You give somebody the right hand of fellowship. It's not just I have no knife in my hand, which I've heard somebody say. That's a sort of Germanic handshake, okay. But it's also that the right hand is associated with all these other associations. I am saying that I am united with you. I am going to bless you, etc. Uh, as far as the plot design, well, the prevailing atmosphere is that of um, mystery and miracle. And God intervenes significantly, repeatedly. So this is when it, the difference between an epic and a normal hero story. There is one type of hero story that is idealized, where we have a paragon of virtue, and Moses seems a bit like that. He's a larger than life figure. But he's not without his fault. He's prone to anger. Although we're told that he was the meekest man that ever lived by the end of his life. 
the humblest, the most obedient. But there are a couple instances where he was not so. One, where he killed an Egyptian out of righteous indignation at the beating of a Hebrew slave. And the other, later on, when he strikes a rock with his staff. I'll, co I'll come to that later on. Uh, but the, the prevailing atmosphere is the presence of God in the midst of his people. That's there all over the place. So the multiplicity of events far from impairing the unity of the story actually reinforces it because there's a consistency and the consistency is God is with his people. And what does that get picked up? It will be gets picked up as Emmanuel. God is with us. He's showing himself to be that. When he appears to Abraham or Abraham to uh, Moses in the desert, and he asks who he is, what shall I tell you? Who shall I say sent me to do this? And he says, I am who I am. I am or I will be what I will be. That's, that's who it is. I am present. I'm always there. You don't have to go to a particular place for me to be present. I am with you in the midst of your suffering. He's about to go with Moses back into Egypt and say, the one who is sent me. So the fullness of the whole adventure and divine inter intervention is the essential quality of the world of this story. And because it's a hero story and is a something that we are to emulate and identify with, it's saying something about God now to the reader. God was with Moses then, he is with us now. This is a part of Christian theology. He is never not present. But that doesn't mean that the characters don't have what we would call the elemental characters of our experience a struggle for physical survival. There's a real tension there. God is presence and yet they are barely holding on to their lives. Uh, finally, there is in this a dominant type scene. What is, the what is a type scene? It's a recurrent situation with common ingredients that provide shape to it. There are type scenes all over the Bible. We, had, we recognize them. A woman at the well. That's a type scene. As soon as you come to it, you recognize, ah, there's a woman at a well. What happens with a woman at a well? Well, where does that first happen? Somebody's getting married. There's a, right? There's a woman at a well. Okay, well, once that's the case, and you're going to meet you're going to meet somebody that you're going to be married to at the well. Well, what do people do? They identify that with a particular situation. They put themselves there. Who else hangs out at the well? Prostitutes. Somebody's looking for love. I'm going to go there. Right? When Jesus goes to the well, there's a woman at the well. She's not a prostitute, but she's a woman that has had one partner after the next. Married, remarried, she's there. Right? But that's a type scene, and he. Uh, he and she both recognize it. And so does the reader. <coughs> but the type scene here has, as I say, common ingredients. And this is repeated throughout the epic in this sequence. One, a crisis threatens the Israelites. This is Moses we're talking about here. A crisis comes. Two, the people fail the test of their faith and complain to Moses. There's a test being given on, on two sides. Pharaoh, we already know what he's going to do. He's going to say no. God's told us. But what are the people going to do? How are the Israelites going to respond? Because they're also being tested, funnily enough. Crisis threatens them. The people fail the test of their faith. They complain to Moses. Thirdly, Moses cries out to God on their behalf. Fourthly, God rescues the people or provides them 
what they need, like manna. Fifthly, God rebukes the people and or reveals something to them. So he, he gives them what they need, but at the same time, he does inform them that this is unacceptable conduct to complain. But he's, he's pulling them along like you would with, with children. There's an object lesson in this story. I want you to learn this lesson. It's going to take time for this relationship to develop. This pattern, by the way, uh, that I'm talking about begins at the Red Sea in Exodus 14. And it marks this all over the place. So there's a conflict between human weakness on the one hand and divine strength uh, on the other hand. So how about the story? The story is marked by suspense throughout. It's a can't-put-it-down story. Even if you put it down, you want to pick it up again because you want to see what happens next. It is, it is an excellent uh, story. And it's, it's, it's almost like mystery stories where, where it concludes on a cliffhanger and you have to come back the next time. Tolkien writes like this, uh, so does Dickens in his uh, novels. Danger at hand at all points. Uh, it starts with foreign oppressors, the Egyptians, and the hostile environment that goes with that. There's not enough food or drink, so you're going to die if you don't have that. Um, and God's punishment at disobedience, these are everywhere in there. There's also conflict in the plot. First between Pharaoh and God, later between uh, the people and God. Everyone knows about the 12 miracles or the 12 plagues given to uh, Pharaoh to, to uh, tell him to let his, his people go. But most people don't attend that the people of Israel complain, murmur against God 10 times. There's a parallel going on there. Pharaoh's tested and he is found wanting. He is crushed. The people of God, having been delivered, are tested 10 times. They murmur 10 times. And on the 10th time, uh, in Deuteronomy 32, uh, Moses pronounces his verdict on the whole interaction between God and his people, praising God for his uh, faithfulness and dispraising Israel for its faithlessness. It's an interesting thing. It's right there early on in Scripture. And those are the 40, the, the people who God left to die in the wilderness. And he's going to deal with the next generation, their children. So it's not only Pharaoh that's getting tested. We're not reading it very carefully if we see that. So this is the dominant uh, motif here. And uh, at the same time, and I, this one really needs to be brought to the forefront, there is an anti-epic motif. And this is, this is the most complicated feature of it. And this is one that Milton pulls out so well in Paradise Lost. This is a hero story like no other hero story, because the heroes aren't the heroes. Moses is not the hero of this story. He's an example to us insofar as he becomes humble and obedient to God. That's, his, that's the, the extent of his heroism, really. Like when he does the, the uh, uses his staff and performs miracle against uh, Pharaoh, it's sort of like Harry Potter. We can't imitate this, and there's nothing to be imitated. There. He is the instrument for God to work. God's the hero of this account. <clears throat> Moses demonstrates inadequacy. The great figure of Moses, who is great, all the Israelites look to him, and we do. And every prophet thereafter looks to Moses as the figure of the prophet. They keep hearkening back to Moses, how he acted and what was delivered to Moses, namely the law of God. This is all there for us to 
follow. And yet, Moses is not the hero of this story. He is shown repeatedly to be inadequate. He can't even do what he's been called to do in the beginning. He insists that his brother come along and speak for him. He's also plagued by doubts that he can do it. Not You don't get many heroic characters in classical literature who are, portray, who are portrayed as being inadequate to the point of not being able to speak and who are plagued by doubts that they can do what they've been called to do. You just don't see it. There's an internal conflict in the character. And part of this is what makes him useful for God's purposes. He's, he doesn't have the uh, hubris of the great characters who've been gifted and are so supremely self-confident that they think that they are God's gift to humanity. You don't get that with Moses. He doesn't think, you know, do you not realize how special I am? Like, I'm Harry Potter. None of that. None of that. You don't get that in this at all. He is aware of his own inadequacy. He has doubts about his vocation, and yet he still does it. <coughs> and he has a dubious background. Let's add it to that. Where did he come from? Moses. Uh, heroes don't tend to have a shadowy background. They have noble beginnings. They're the offspring of a goddess or a god and a human figure, this sort of superhuman character who has superhuman ancestry. Not Moses. He's the son of a Hebrew woman who gets named, for sure. But still, she's not one of the descendants of the great Joseph. You would think he, right? You would think that he was born into Joseph's bloodline somehow. No, we don't get any sense of that. So the story is jo of Joseph is significant actually significant, not only for its miraculous deeds, but actually for delivering the people of Israel into bondage. That's what the story of Joseph is about. How did we get to the point where the people are being oppressed? God brought it about. That's what? He saved them, but at the same time, he put them in a place of extreme peril. And then, one of, and, and the man that is going to carry the story onwards isn't one of... Uh, Joseph's ancestors, not related as far as we know. She's just a girl. She's just a Hebrew girl. <coughs> so what a character. He is not, so he is an, an there's an anti-epic motif. Dubious character, full of inadequacy, full of doubts. And all of these uh, will exalt the God who leads this. It's not about what a wonderful people the Israelites were, are because repeatedly we show the imperfections. We're shown the imperfections of the Israelites. Their rebelliousness, their lack of faith, um, their tendency to complain all the time and want to go back where they were. This is not how a Epic tends to be portrayed. The center fi central figure, Moses, is not admirable in a sense. And the people are not admirable. Both of these things are going to highlight the character of God as heroic. In spite of the people, which then make, break, begs the question of why he chooses them. So this is an anti-epic strain. So when Moses hesitates to assume leadership in Exodus 4 and introduces his, this theme of human inadequacy and claims that he's not eloquent, it contrasts him to every other epic hero I can think of. They're all eloquent. Achilles is a superb speaker. Aeneas, Odysseus. Uh, he's also afraid others aren't going to listen to me. Like, who, who talks like that? Son of a slave. His only mark of distinction is that God's chosen him. That's it. 
the events leading to the Exodus are all God's activity. The twelve, the ten plagues are the Israelites don't participate in a revolt. They're just onlookers, spectators. And at the conclusion, they despoil the Egyptians. They take their goods. God, they, God commands them to plunder the Egyptians. That's not a particularly admirable action, even. It sounds like theft. But God commands it, so there's something else at work there. Well, everything belongs to God anyway. Not the, So we're aware of that. But still, from their vantage point, this is like, take their stuff. Take their gold in particular. And what do they then do with it? First thing they do with it, well, they make a golden calf. And then they get involved in all sorts of sexual immorality that goes along with that worship. They're acting like their God is the same as the gods of Egypt. Baal worship. So the Israelites are not in any way admirable. So again, this seems anti-epic. <clears throat> and so the only thing that's emphasized then is, is the strength. And the strength of, by strength of hand, the Lord brought you out from this place when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and you will tell your son on that day it is because of what the Lord did for me that when I came out of Egypt. This is the Passover. It's all about that. If you're in any doubt about what the significance of this epic story is, it is not about Moses. It is not about Israel. It is about what God did. That's the take, it home, take home story. And that means that, that the story can be transplanted out of that narrative and into every narrative. Because it's always about what God does. And God is not only the God of Israel, although those are his special chosen people, it's about him and how he is. So God is praised. So he is the epic hero, actually. And there is no epic like it. You read the Odyssey, and it's not about Athena. She's there. She helps Odysseus. But Odysseus is the hero, not Athena. He loves wisdom, he, he acts like Athena, but it's not about Athena. Here it really is about God, a huge difference. And there's no, doubt, there's no doubt about this. Uh, Exodus 14, 13 and 14, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be still. Similarly, the Lord routed the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. Israel saw the great work which the Lord did against the Egyptians. And then in response to this, get Exodus 15, we get the Song of Moses. And he portrays God as an epic warrior. The Lord is a man of war. That's how he's, that sounds like an epic hero. He's recognized the heroism of God in epic terms, right? So this is, again, this doesn't follow the traditional epic in the Greco-Roman understanding of it. God is the hero of this story. And this is further emphasized, as I say, by showing how unworthy the Israelites are. And this is most strongly illustrated in the 10 instances of complaining so go to Numbers 14.22 in your notes afterwards. Just write it in, Numbers 14.22. God says, the, his people have put me to the proof these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice. If you go back, you can find ten occasions where they do not obey. They don't listen. Who else didn't listen? Pharaoh. Are they treated differently than Pharaoh? Yes, they are. But are they better than Pharaoh? In a sense, no. Uh, the idea that glory is to be given to the hero is, and that the hero here is God, um, receives its culmination in Deuteronomy 32, which is a song that praises God's faithfulness and dispraises Israel's faithlessness. He is the faithful one. He is 
the ageless one. He is the rock of peace. He is the Lord of all. He does not move. His ways are not our ways. Represented throughout this. Even Moses uh, fails. Remember I said he was unrealistic. He's not an example, a role model in the sense. He is guilty of pride and impatience and disobedience. He strikes the rock at Meribah, for which reason he's not allowed to go into the promised land. Like if this wasn't, if it wasn't bad enough that all the Israelites are going to die in the wilderness, even Moses doesn't get there. It's very sad. He didn't get to see. It. He got to see it, but he didn't get to go there. He gets to stand up on Mount Pisgah and look down. There's the place where the people are going to go. You're not going to go there. You're going to die here. Pretty serious judgment. This is Numbers 20, verses 1 to 13, if you want to look it up after. So the epic here is about God, and we will see that epic also reflected. I just talked about Moses, and by that I'm talking about the five books of Moses, but really focused on Exodus onwards, those last three books of the Pentateuch. But we could also talk about David as a similar sort of character. 